So, Facebook was down today. It was down for six hours. Why is that so crazy? Why is that so revolutionary? In today's video, I'm talking about why Facebook has been dreading an event like this and what this could mean in a longer perspective to the platform and to people's continued use of Facebook. So, okay, first of all, Facebook has been fearing an outage like this for a very long time. And you'd think, okay, six hours, what's the big deal? But to F Facebook, six hours is a very, very long time. That's six hours where people are thinking of other things to do with their lives. That's six hours times 60 minutes <laughs> that people are spending doing other things than using Facebook. Can you think, okay, after those, that time, they'll all just come back and it'll all be back to normal, right? But in that time, in those six hours, people have been exchanging social contact details. They've been uh, finding other ways of contacting friends and family members. They've tuned out of groups. They've gone out. They've uh, perhaps gotten a new hobby. They've gone on Wikipedia. They're starting up a new education. They're, uh, they've discovered a new YouTube channel. And there they go. That's uh, six hours of a person suddenly starting up a new trajectory in their life, a trajectory that could lead them basically anywhere, and a trajectory that could probably, possibly lead them away from Facebook. Now, why am I such a Facebook critic? Why do I struggle so much with Facebook? And why should you struggle with Facebook? Why should you have a problem with Facebook? I mean, what's the harm? I mean, it's a good way of keeping in contact with friends, right? So it's the, got the Facebook wall, you got news, you get information, there is groups where you can uh, interact with other people. That's great, right? That's, isn't Facebook amazing? Isn't it a good chance to get in touch with people? Well, my problem with Facebook and the reason why I think this is a problem, why this platform is so problematic starts and uh, uh, really funnels itself on one thing, and that's the like feature. The like feature uh, is really uh, ultimately what Facebook is all about, and really it defines you know, the modern century, because we're all looking to be like today. The main reason why people use Facebook is to get in touch with people that will like them, people that will approve of them, people that will see the world the way they do. And you know, it's an attractive idea to want to be understood, to want to be liked. I mean, haven't we all at some point been caught in the game of seeking likes, of seeking to be liked, of seeking to find people that can understand us? However, be careful what you wish for. If you want people to approve of you, if you want people to like you, you're also going to find that you're going to have to compromise yourself to fit in, to be liked, to be approved. And perhaps you might say, oh, I'm, I would never do that. I'm authentic. I'm honest. I'm myself. However, what comes to happen is even if you start out by being yourself, even if you start out finding people by being who you are, a lot of the time, the way you are interpreted and understood by other people is very based on their perception of you and how they want to perceive you. Over time, that perception can come to become a prison. People see you based on your social identity and they ask and expect of you to conform to this social identity. You have to constantly fill this role for other people. People expect you to have a certain set of opinions. They expect you to feel the way they do about political arguments. They expect you to think the way they do. And they expect you to always uh, argue with and see and point things out that they will already agree with. At some point, this becomes an echo chamber. As Facebook says, so oh, hey, these people, they always like each other's posts. They must like, like each other's. We're going to show them each other's posts. Oh, hey, this person is starting to post weird stuff. Other people don't like it. We're going to turn this guy off Facebook. Nobody's going to see his posts anymore. He's going to disappear into the void. At some point, highways, social highways are set up on Facebook where different groups coexist peacefully together. Uh, the left 
only ever interacting with the left, the right, only ever interacting with the right, people become stuck in these echo chambers. Everyone around you who you engage with are people that will and have historically agreed with everything you've ever posted and said before. Everyone else is gone. You find yourself losing touch with people that disagree with you. You find yourself losing touch with friends and family members that used to be cool and interesting. And gradually it becomes more and more difficult to understand these people. You never get to hear their point of view. You never get to see how they feel about things and why they feel a certain way. So you start assuming things about them. You hear things about them. You hear rumors. You hear people talk about them. You build up straw mans. Suddenly, the other side is cold, crazy, psychotic, evil, monstrous, and your side is good, perfect, beautiful, amazing, incredible, right in all ways. The other side is a um, dark, unconscious, threatening, weird part that you've never heard of. Who are these Trump supporters anyway? How can they think like that? I've never seen one. How did Trump even get elected in the first place? I've never even met the Trump supporter. I've never seen anyone post anything that supports Trump. I don't know anybody that would vote for him. <laughs> huh. Yeah. Echo chambers, they're dangerous in that sense because it creates and drives a false kind of consciousness. We start getting social facts wrong. We start assuming that everyone thinks the way we do. We start assuming that everyone thinks the way we do. <laughs> and uh, what happens is over time, our ability to handle disagreement weakens. It becomes more and more difficult to have a conflict with another person because you don't have conflicts with other people anymore. People always agree with you. They always say, yeah, Eric, you're so amazing. You're so right. They always applaud everything you post and say. They always share you on. They always think you're great. So when people don't, it's like an uncomfortable experience. Do they not understand me right? Did they misread what I said? Is there something wrong with their brains? Like, what is the reason? How can they not see things the way I see it? And, you know, over time, you know, you don't even recognize how extreme you become in these echo chambers. Because when people always egg you on, when people always say you're great, no matter what you say, when people always agree with you, you find yourself, like, encouraged. You, you start feeling like, oh, uh, these people, they really like that I'm a liberal. They really like that I am a feminist. They really like that I post these content. I'm going to start going even further. I'm going to start being even more feminist, even more liberal. I'm going to start doing these things. I'm going to start doing it so well, so amazingly, so greatly. And uh, that drives virtue signaling, you know. Virtue signaling, that can happen on any side. Anyone can get caught in this trap. And it's uh, to the point where people say things to get a response, you know. Those people that are posting such extreme content, those people that uh, write such crazy statements, those people that post such extreme headlines, you know, we always wonder what's happening in their minds. But those people, they're really us. They're really another version of us. We laugh at the crazy feminist that talks about hating men. And... Uh, we don't understand how a person could come to those terms. Well, it didn't happen in a vacuum. It was a person that was uh, constantly egged on, shared on by their friends and family members uh, to the point there they became more and more extreme. You know, they started out like really intelligent, cool people. They started out like really open minded and really creative and uh, uh, with a good heart and with good intentions. But they got lost in that because we don't really deal well with being agreed with. People don't really know how to handle support. People don't really know how to handle um, constantly being encouraged, you know, because if people are constantly encouraged, you know, there is no limit to what they could do. Disagreements are essential and Facebook eliminates the possibility for anyone to have a positive disagreement you know status is so important people want to li be liked people want to be fit, fit in 
So a lot of time when you're getting conflicts on Facebook, what tends to go wrong, the first thing that tends to go wrong is, um, first of all, Facebook is not really geared to set up the room to have an intellectual exchange. It's not about learning something from the other person. It's not about understanding their viewpoint. It's not about figuring out how they think or helping them better their arguments or sharpen their thought process. It's about winning and it's about protecting your social image and protecting the social image of your friends and the people that you agree with. So we are so concerned with this that we are more interested in winning the debate or protecting our side than in learning from the other person and growing as a result of the exchange. That means whatever we say, whatever we do in these social discussions, it's to further our identity and to tear down the identity of the other group. Strawmans are <laughs> the basis of almost every single Facebook argument I've ever participated in. That means uh, we are so concerned with building up a false image of the other group that we have literally no time to understand what they're saying. We're looking at whatever they say that could be interpreted in a negative way. We're looking at the weakest point of their argument. We're looking at anything that we could use to besmirch their reputation. We're looking to use guilt by association. We're looking to connect them to uh, people that we don't like. We're looking to connect their ideas, to make analogies, to uh, Nazi Germany. We're looking to connect it to things that bring out a sense of disgust in us. We're looking to create something that we can hate. And at the same time, we're so concerned with protecting our own side, showing how beautiful our side is, how incredible it is, and how right it is. We are so righteous, and they are so, so dark and evil. Now, Facebook was down for six hours, and I wonder, what were you thinking about during those six hours? Facebook is really good at keeping us from thinking. It uses flashing images, screens that pop out whenever somebody writes to you immediately, blue flashing lights, things that just make you go, oh, oh shit, there's something going on. <laughs> Facebook wants you to pay attention and it will do anything it can to make you pay attention. So a lot of time what happens is it tells you things are interesting. It tells you you must listen to this. It tells you this is urgent. It tells you this needs to be responded to right away. It tells you you have to deal with this right now. You have to set everything else aside and you have to pick this up right now. Despite the fact that there is no rush. There is no rush to reply to these conversations. There is no rush. There is no immediacy. It's fake urgency and it creates stress. There is stress in a sense because there is a constant feel, a need to constantly be active, to constantly pay attention. There is stress as you're trying to focus on work and you see that flashing light and you're like, who is messaging me? Who is it that wants me to do something from me? What do they want? Who are these people? <laughs> and uh, Facebook is really good at social manipulation and social engineering and nudging. Facebook always works on operates in the principle of the grass is greener mentality because if you look at it, if you look through your wall, through this most things you see under your wall is actually not that interesting. If you scroll through your wall and you'll find that 99% of the things you come across, once again I make up the statistic here, uh, but a, a high number, <laughs> a high percentage of the things you see on Facebook are kind of pointless and irrelevant and not really that important. But Facebook, Facebook tells you, well, that thing that's coming there, that could be important, you know, there could be something important here somewhere. So keep scrolling, keep scrolling, keep going deeper, keep going down. Maybe there's gonna be something there. Maybe there's gonna be something interesting. But is there ever? Is there ever anything interesting? Do you ever hear people say something fascinating on Facebook? And to the extent that it, they do, uh, is it worth the time you spent looking for it? 
A reason why things on Facebook are not that fascinating is because fascinating thoughts are dangerous. Things that make you think are dangerous, scary, difficult. When you write a post that requires thought and cognitive capacity, you write the post that is going to make people scroll because there's no time. It's long, it's complicated, and oh, there's a funny meme. <laughs> and so there it goes, it's gone. Nobody saw it, nobody read it, nobody understood it. To the extent that people read what you said, that they maybe read the headline, they saw the first sentence and then decided based on that if they agreed with you or not. And then it didn't matter whatever you wrote in that post. It didn't matter your explanation or your thought process. The only thing that mattered was the headline you used and the choice of words that you used in your first message. It goes beyond that too. I've noticed something on Facebook. If I post something on Facebook and the first comment is negative, all the other comments are going to be negative too. If I post something on Facebook and the first comment is positive, all the other comments are going to be positive too. And that's social peer pressure. That means people are not looking at whether this post is correct or not. They're looking at, okay, do people, the other people verify and agree with this? And if they do, then I'll do it too, because that's a way for me to get clout. If I agree with something that everyone else agrees with, that raises my clout. If I disagree with something that somebody else seems to disagree with, that gives me clout. And that's the thing. We're chasing clout. Clout that nobody's ever going to remember. Things that <laughs> are going to hold no value. Things that you cannot use in a work interview. Things that you cannot do anything with. Fluffy clout. Fluffy social value. Now, people have had six hours to think about something else to do. And I wonder if they thought of something cool. I wonder if you thought of something cool. What did you do in these six hours? Did you sleep through it? Perhaps you didn't even notice. Well, I can assure you, people noticed. <laughs> a lot of people noticed. So perhaps it did spark a revolution. Perhaps it did spark a change. Or perhaps we're all going to be back to normal tomorrow. Who knows? What do you think? Let me know in the comments down below.